Now, by way of introduction, um, I would love to talk a little bit about uh, Jenny. Um, she is the 19th century women's history specialist at the church history department in Salt Lake City. She earned her PhD at George Mason University in DC in 2013 in American history. She is the project lead on a website collecting all of Eliza R. Snow's discourses at the churchhistorianpress.org. And she will be publishing a print volume of selected discourses in a few years. Her book, First, The Life and Faith of Emma Smith will come out with Desert Book on March 29th. She has previously published at the pulpit, 185 Years of Discourses of Latter-day Saint Women, which is found on the Gospel Library app, and The Witness of Women, First-Hand Accounts and Testimonies of the Restoration. She has spoken at Time Out for Women, BYU Women's Conference, and BYU Education Week. Jenny loves to quilt, travel, read, play board games, and do yoga. Sister Reader, we are thrilled to have you this evening, and now I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you so much. I am delighted to be with you tonight, too. I, first of all, wanted to share um, my screen and show you some of the resources that we've put together as the Church History Department that will especially help you in your Come Follow Me study this year. So this is, um, this is just the church website. And if we go into Gospel Library, it is the same format as it is on your phone. So this should look familiar. Uh, if we go into Restoration and Church History, we can of course see um, Saints Volumes 1 and Volume 2. I hope you've read those or will read those because I think they've been, done an excellent job on those. Um, if you want to learn more about any of the people or places or events in those books, go to Church History Topics, and there's a bunch of really great essays, short essays that will give you more information on a ton of, of subjects. Um, and there's even one on Emma. So there you go. And there's additional resources there, too. So also on this app is um, a, a Doctrine and Covenants study guide that will help you with your come follow me. And if you go under historical resources, this is excellent. It's lined up exactly with the come follow me um, sections every week and they're really helpful. And um, they, they'll take you uh, to a direct link of the Joseph Smith papers production of the first uh, written version of the revelations and give you more really detailed information. There's also the book Revelations in Context and those are also about some of the revelations. So this one, Thou Art an Elect Lady, coming up is about Emma. And they're really excellent. But I just want to show you a few, whoops, a few other things here in this um, app that you might not be aware of. Okay. Okay. So we have under women's history, we have um, At the Pulpit, which was mentioned, and this is a great book of discourses by, by women, talks by women. There's also Daughters in My Kingdom, which has important uh, minutes from the, it has all the minutes of the Nauvoo Relief Society and several other important documents from the first 50 years of Relief Society. Um, but then there's this also this other section that I wanted to share with you that I think is really cool, and that is the global histories. So here you have every country, eventually we'll have every country where the church is officially recognized, and you'll have um, stories of the organization of the church there. This one's Bosnia and Herzegovina. But then you also have stories of faith. And these are incredible stories about the very first members in these locations. They're beautiful stories. Sometimes there are uh, pictures. Um, they're incredible. And I really encourage you to, to read through these with your families. It's a fantastically rich history. So the other website that I wanted to show you is the Church Historians Press, and I'm gonna go right here. 
Um, this is also a really great um, resource. So what we have on here, we have the diaries of Emmeline Wells and, and um, the discourses of Eliza R. Snow, and I'm working on this. So we have over 1200 discourses by her and we're adding another uh, batch of them on Tuesday. So stay tuned. Um, if we have a picture of the location where it is, it's there. But these are some incredible talks and discourses. Um, so I just wanted to share with you those resources because there's a lot that can help you and your family as you prepare, um, as you study, come follow me. But my main point today in, in meeting with you is to talk a little bit about one of my very favorite women and that is Emma Smith. And I think we, we talk so much about Joseph Smith as the prophet of, the, of this dispensation and of this, um, the restoration. And we don't realize what a huge role Emma played in the restoration. And I think by so doing, when we understand the role that Emma played, we can also understand the role that we play in the ongoing restoration. And that it's not just for men holding the priesthood, but it's for everybody. She really was a pillar of the restoration. President Nelson said that the heavens are just as open to women who are endowed with God's power flowing from their priesthood covenants as they are to men who bear the priesthood. I pray that truth will register upon each of your hearts because I believe it will change your life. Sisters, you have the right to draw liberally upon the Savior's power to help your family and others you love. I love this painting of the sacred grove or the first vision in the sacred grove. But I love one account of the first vision shows that there were several angels there. And I like to think that perhaps we were a part of that, um, that we were heralding in the restoration. President Nelson also said that accessing the power of God in your life requires the same thing that the Lord instructed Emma and each of you to do. He said, I invite you to study prayerfully section 25 of the Doctrine and Covenants and discover what the Holy Ghost will teach you. Your personal spiritual endeavor will bring you joy as you gain, understand, and use the power with which you have been endowed. I love the way that President Nelson connects the temple endowment with section 25 and with the restoration. Surely this is a call to live up to our covenants and to live up to who we are and to continue to participate in the restoration. Section 25 is really a beautiful section. It talks about the Lord's relationship to Emma um, in a couple of different verses. He knows her and he values her and has given her a specific mission. mission. Um, he says, hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God while I speak unto you, Emma Smith, my daughter. For verily I say unto you, all those who receive my gospel are sons and daughters in my kingdom. I love this for a couple of reasons. One is because he knows her name and he calls her by name, just as he has called Joseph Smith by name, Martin Harris by name, Oliver Cowdery by name, and others that have received revelations from him. Um, David Whitmer and um, Joseph Smith Sr. and Hiram Smith and others. He knows them by name. And then he tells her a revelation I give unto you concerning my will. And if you are faithful and walk in the paths of virtue before me, I will preserve thy life and thou shalt receive an inheritance in Zion. These are the first two verses of this section. And the last verse is kind of a bookend. Well, this is the second to last verse where the Lord says, keep my commandments continually and a crown of righteousness thou shalt receive. And except thou do this where I am, you cannot come. I love that because I think he is promising her, he's giving her her divine heritage and saying that as his daughter, she was baptized very soon before this revelation was given and could truly be called the daughter of Christ or the daughter of God as a result of her covenant through that ordinance. Um, and he's promising her an inheritance that he will give her all that she has. At the end, he says, a crown of righteousness thou shalt receive. I think this is really interesting because a lot of people um, throughout history and throughout the time of Emma Smith have looked down on her and have 
disparaged her, particularly because she didn't come west with the saints and with Brigham Young. She had a really tense relationship with Brigham Young. Um, and they think that she, people often think that she fell away from the church. But I'm, I'm going to tell you something really interesting right now. At the end of her life, um, shortly before she passed away, she had a dream and her nurse recorded this dream. And in her dream, Joseph came for her and took her to a beautiful mansion. And inside this mansion was a nursery with babies, uh, one baby. And it was her son, Don Carlos, who had died at the age of 14 months. And she was so excited to see this baby. And she said to Joseph, but where are the others? And Joseph said, don't worry, you shall have all of them. And then she turned around and saw the savior. And I think this is evidence that she was in a good place with her savior and that she did keep his commandments and that she did receive the, a crown of, of righteousness and his inheritance. So let's first talk about Emma and the scriptures. This is a picture of the, the first written document um, that we have of this revelation. This is not the original. And I think this is really interesting because I wonder, um, we know that the Lord told Emma in section 25 that she should be a scribe for Joseph. And so, and she was, that was kind of retrospect, retroactive because the revelation was given in 1830 and she was his first scribe in 18, starting in 1827. Um, but I sometimes wonder when she, when he received this revelation for Emma, if she didn't scribe it for him as he was giving it to her, and perhaps she kept a copy of that revelation. This one is written in the, in the revelation book and by John Whitmer, <clears throat> you can see it's titled the 27th commandment. We um, consider it the 25th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, but this was before they titled the book, The Doctrine and Covenants, and it was the Book of Commandments. And at this point, it was in the number 27 slot, but it is the revelation. So the Lord tells Emma that she, she will be a scribe for Joseph and that she would be ordained under his hand to expound scripture, which means to preach or teach or to explain um, scripture. And also he tells her in verse eight that her time would be given to writing and to learning much. I love that. I love that he cared enough for a woman to be that engaged with his words and to, to have a part of producing his words. I think this is really interesting. I love this about Emma and I think it shows how she is a, a pillar of the restoration. Moroni told Joseph several times as he came to the Hill Cumorah every year that he needed to bring the right person with him before he could receive the plates. In 1826, uh, before he was married to Emma, he told, um, Moroni told Joseph, you have one more chance. And Joseph was worried. At first he thought the right one was his brother Alvin, but Alvin had passed away in November of 1823. And so he was desperate to figure out who the right one was. He sought revelation and he actually saw through a seer stone, Emma Hale. And he told his parents later, he said, you know, I am tired of being lonely. I really miss Alvin, my brother. And I think I'm going to marry Emma Hale. And so Emma's father was not approved, does not approve of the marriage. And so they um, left, they eloped in New York and got married and then she moved to his home in Manchester, New York. And at the time, at the appointed date, she went with him in a, a wagon, a carriage that was loaned to them by Joseph Knight Sr. And some records state that she stayed in the wagon. Some state that she got out and kneel, kneeled down on the ground and prayed while Joseph was meeting with Moroni. And there's one record that's a reminiscence and isn't entirely reliable. that says that she actually went with him up to meet with Moroni. But there's, Joseph could not have received the plates without Emma. Emma worked very hard to protect the scriptures. Um, the day after he received the plates, they had, um, he, he didn't have a box or a lock to secure them. And so he went to find some work about an hour away in the town of Macedon. And Joseph Smith Sr. heard some rumors that people were gathering and they wanted to get the plates because they were gold and of great value. So 
he told Emma this and Emma worried immediately. Now she had been trained by her brothers to be an excellent horse, a horse rider. And she found a horse that she could take and she rode it bareback an hour away to get Joseph and to warn him of the danger to the place. Um, later when they decided to move back to Harmony to her family, to the area where her family lived, they hid the plates in a barrel of beans. And then in their home, Emma created, or she made this linen cover, like a, like a dishcloth, I guess, to cover the plates when Joseph wasn't translating them. She also got a glass box. And for the longest time, I did not know what a glass box was. It's not a box made of glass, because obviously that's gonna expose the plates, but it's a box that glass was kept in. So it was sturdy and protective. And then she also got a red Moroccan leather box that she could put the manuscript in. So she was very careful in protecting those, those plates and the manuscript. Um, and we know that she also scribed for Joseph when he translated the Bible, the Joseph Smith translation. They took that, tra that manuscript with them to Missouri when they moved there. And Joseph thought he would get it published there, but a lot of things didn't turn out the way they had planned in Missouri. And he was imprisoned in Liberty Jail. And Emma had to get the kids back to Illinois in safety and the, the manuscript. When they got to the frozen Mississippi River to cross over into Illinois, they discovered it wasn't frozen thick enough that they could all ride over in the wagon. So she actually had a pouch at, with a waistband so that she could wear this under her skirt and put the manuscript in the pouch. And I love this depiction of her walking across that river. She had a baby and a little toddler and then two little children that were clinging to her. Plus she had that Bible manuscript under her skirt. She did everything she could to protect the scriptures. We talked a little bit about Emma as a scribe. Um, this is really interesting. This is the Emma and Joseph home in Harmony, Pennsylvania. And I haven't been there, but I have coworkers who have set this all up. And this is an interesting story. Mark Stakers, one of my coworkers, was in charge of this site. And he was looking for a turkey feather that, the, that Joseph would have used something very similar as the quill for his um, translation. And he couldn't find one. Mark couldn't find one anywhere. He even went on eBay and ordered something that was similar, but it wasn't a turkey feather. And he was praying to know what to do about this. And he, he went outside one morning and there on the step was a turkey feather. So that's the turkey feather that he found. So Emma did initially um, scribe for him until Martin Harris came. Um, one person who spoke at um, her funeral said that she had very feminine and beautiful handwriting, which I, I love. Martin Harris came to Harmony at the very time that Emma was very sick. And she was pregnant with her first child. And he stayed and later took the first section of the manuscript, what we call the 116 pages, um, back to his home. And the day after he left, Emma had her baby and the baby passed away immediately. And was she was in very poor health and Joseph was very worried about her. He didn't leave her side for two weeks. And finally, when she was kind of coherent enough, she said, Joseph, where's the manuscript? And he said, I don't know, I'm gonna go get it. And she said, please go, my mom will take care of me. So Joseph went back to New York and discovered that Martin and his wife had lost the manuscript. And he went back to his family home and just said to his mother, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess everything up. I'm gonna lose this gift and this charge from the Lord. And the second thing he said was, what am I gonna tell Emma? Emma was such an integral part of that. So we know that luckily he was able to repent and get the plates back and continue that um, translation and that Oliver Cowdery and others came to help him. I love this scripture in section 25 where the Lord tells Emma, murmur not because of the things which thou hast not seen for they are withheld from thee and from the world which, was with, which is wisdom in me in a time to come. Emma never saw the plates, which I think she was a stronger woman than I would have been because I think I would have wanted to take a peek. 
Um, but she talks about later in her life how she, when she would handle them under that linen cloth, and she would pick them up to clean under them, and she could tell that they were of a pliable, durable um, substance of gold, and she could hear them, the, the sound of the pages that they would make. But she, interestingly enough, I don't think she needed to see them to be a witness of this great work. She saw Joseph translating. She knew the power that came over him, his lack of education, his lack of ability to do this. And she knew that he was a prophet of God. And so she was a witness in another way. In fact, she said this um, in her an interview that her sons gave with her in 1879, a few months before she died. She said at the very end, she said, I know Mormonism to be true. And I believe the church to have been established by divine direction. I have complete faith in it. She describes the revelation process or the translation process with Joseph um, using the seer stone. And then she says this, I was an active participant in the scenes that transpired and was present during the translation of the plates and had cognizance of the things as they transpired. It is marvelous to me, a marvel and a wonder. I love that she used those words because I think those are words that Joseph begins um, in several revelations to the, to the men that are involved. A marvelous work and a wonder is about to come forth. She was just as much a part of that as those men. Uh, President Kimball said that, um, talked about the importance of women and the role that they play in the restoration. He said, I stress again the deep need each woman has to study the scriptures. We want our homes to be blessed with sister scriptorians, whether you are single or married, young or old, widowed or living in a family. President Nelson said, we need women who have a bedrock understanding of the doctrine of Christ and who will use that understanding to teach and help raise a sin resistant generation. Emma was the beginning of that. She knew that she helped Joseph procure the plates. She protected the plates and she scribed for him. And she was a witness of that marvelous work and wonder. And remember her time was to be given to much study um, and writing. So now I wanna talk a little bit about Emma and the hymns. In section 25, we know that the Lord asked Emma to make a selection of sacred hymns. In fact, um, this is a really unique responsibility and it's one that is not often used by women at this time. It's always men that collect hymns and edit hymn books. So this is a new thing. This is a very progressive thing. Um, I love what he says in that next verse, in verse 12, because I think it gives us some insight into who our Heavenly Father is, who the Lord is. He says, my soul delighteth in the song of the heart. Yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me, and it shall be answered with a blessing upon their heads. I love that, that he is a, a being who delights and who rejoices. Later in the section, he tells Emma that she should delight in her husband. Um, but this is, a, this is a living being that has feeling and emotion and sense. And um, I think it's beautiful. So that's what she does. She collects hymns from all different places and from all different faith traditions, which I think is interesting. If you think about it, the church at this point is very young and is made up of people from different faith traditions. But by combining the truths of all of those and the things that they all come with and bring with them, they're able to create this beautiful way to worship together. Um, I talked a little bit about the role of women that was not in collecting hymns, but she would find hymns in newspapers. She may have looked in her newspaper in Harmony, which often printed hymns. And later when she moved to, um, up, arrived in Kirtland, she would send some of these hymns in the mail to William W. Phelps, who was in Missouri, and he was a publisher and he was going to print them. He printed some of those hymns in this newspaper, The Evening in the Morning Star. Um, unfortunately, we learned that in 1833, so that um, press was destroyed by a mob and all of her efforts had been lost. 
And it kind of reminds me of how the first part of her scribing of the Book of Mormon was also lost. And so she's always starting over again and picking up where things are, are destroyed. Um, she, she was amazingly patient. The other thing that I think is interesting is the section was given in the year 1830, but the hymn book was not um, done until 1835. Here's a picture. You can see how little that hymn book is. And they made him that small. That was a typical size for a hymn book because you could keep it in your pocket and take it with you wherever you went. And um, also, I think it's interesting that the hymns did not, the hymn book does not include the tunes or the music. Part of that may have been because the press wasn't that sophisticated to make um, music, the clefs and the, and the, the um, notes. But part of it was also because the hymns were sung to different tunes and they could be sung to different tunes. So they were labeled by what meter they were in. But I love the preface of this hymn book. It, she wrote, in order to sing by the spirit and with the understanding, it is necessary that the Church of the Latter-day Saints should have a collection of sacred hymns adapted to their faith and belief in the, in the gospel. And as far as can be, holding forth the promises made to the fathers who died in the precious faith of a glorious resurrection and a thousand years reign on earth with the son of man in his glory. Notwithstanding the church as it were is still in its infancy. So this is 1835, 1836. It's only five or six years old. At, yet as the song of the righteous is a prayer unto God, there she is drawing upon her revelation. It is sincerely hoped that the following collection, selected with an eye single to his glory, may answer every purpose till more composed, or till we are blessed with a copious variety of the songs of Zion. That's beautiful. Now, the um, hymn book was, the, the, the copyright of the hymn book says 1835, but it probably wasn't really actually published until 1836, in time for the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. Um, and that was the, the, that dedication we know was a powerful experience with great uh, charismatic gifts and, and prophecies fulfilled with the singing and the, the angels that were there. I love the story of them singing the spirit of God like a fire is burning, which has become a standard at each of our temple dedications. I love that Emma was helping the, the saints to worship together collectively, and that's a powerful thing. But I want to share a story with you from Amanda Barnes-Smith, who was um, in attendance at that temple dedication. She later had a very sacred experience with one of those hymns in a very private worship setting. She and her family were on their way to Missouri. Their plan was to go to Far West, and they stopped for one night at Hans Mill. And that one night happened to be the massacre of Hans Mill. And her husband was killed. And uh, one of her sons was killed and another son was mortally injured. And she um, was desperate. She didn't know what to do. And she received personal revelation. We know the story of using slippery elm bark to make a poultice for her son's hip. Um, but she and a group of women that, was, that remained there would often gather together to pray. And pretty soon the, the mobsters around there, the Missourians asked them or told them they couldn't get together to pray. They were afraid of the saints gathering. And so Amanda went into a nearby cornfield and she said that this cornfield became her temple. I love that. And as she prayed vocally, a voice came to her and recited the words of the hymn, How Firm a Foundation. And that hymn was found in that first hymn book that Emma had um, published. But the last verse of that hymn came with such power and with such force to Amanda. She heard a voice telling her, that soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose. Um, and now I can't remember the rest of it, but he tells her, I will never, ever forsake you. And so I love that, that that hymn, that, um, in, that collective worshiping hymn became a very individual song and prayer to the Lord. Another thing we learned in section 25 is Emma's role as 
um, first lady. Um, I love that. We also know that she's the elect lady and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But she's told in verse five that the office of her calling would be a comfort unto her and to Joseph Smith, her husband, in his afflictions with consoling words in the spirit of meekness. I think it's interesting, number one, that the Lord uses the word office, because that's not often a word that we use today in the sense of a marriage, right? But we have learned that we need to call the, the um, presidents of the organizations, the female organizations, um, officers, and that they hold an office. And that means, in my head, it's like she really has an office with her name on the door, but she doesn't really. But she's given a very specific responsibility. And part of that is to, is to care for her husband. I love that she's told that she should be a comforter to him. She's not to support him from underneath, but she's to come down and wrap her arms around him and comfort him. I love that this is the same word that Jesus tells his apostles before he is crucified, that he would leave them, we'd not leave them comfortless, but that he would give them a comforter in John. And in that sense, I think she has a very holy and divine calling. In verse nine, Emma is told not to fear that her husband shall support thee in the church for unto them is his calling. So she really is the first lady, just like Jill Biden, whatever your politics are, uh, Melania Trump, she was the first lady, the wife of the president. And she did many things to entertain and to host dignitaries in her home. She rode with Joseph in the Nauvoo Legion. Remember, she was an excellent horsewoman. And she, she was an amazing first lady. She was very, um, people admired her. Um, like I said, we know that also she is named in section 25, verse 3, as the elect lady. She is the lady chosen, selected, or elected to lead the other women of the church. And it's 12 years later where she actually is able to do that with the Nauvoo Relief Society. I love that this revelation is not just something that happens within that year, but it's kind of like our patriarchal blessings that sometimes it takes a lot of time for these things to come about. She is told that she should be ordained. Remember how she was given the office. Um, and we don't use this word in the same way anymore, but the early saints did. She was ordained under Joseph's hand to expound scripture and to exhort the church. And that's exactly what she did with the Relief Society. She gathered these women together. She taught them the importance of the Book of Mormon and the importance of Christian discipleship and fellowship in caring for the poor, relieving the poor and the needy and saving souls. Joseph said that the Relief Society was to relieve the poor and save souls. He also said that the church wasn't fully organized until the Relief Society was organized. He really saw that Relief Society, that women's group, or you could even say quorum, although today we use the word quorum for priesthood quorums, but it was a companionship organization to the priesthood. Shortly after the Relief Society was organized, um, the temple ceremony was revealed and we know that the Relief Society was an incredible preparation and part of that temple uh, restoration. Like I said, the Nauvoo Relief Society was a place to understand the meaning of, interpret the scriptures, to encourage or to embolden, to provide relief both physically and emotionally, and to save souls. At that first meeting on March 17, 1842, Emma told the, the women, we are going to do something extraordinary. And it's true, and they did. And we continue as members of the Relief Society to do something extraordinary. I love the story of Relief Society members all over the world over this past year with the pandemic, making millions and millions of masks to relieve the poor. And I'm so grateful that I can belong to this organization. Um, President Nelson said this, he said, we, your brethren, need your strength, your conversion, your conviction, your ability to lead, your wisdom, and your voices. The kingdom of God is not and cannot be complete without women 
who make sacred covenants and then keep them. Women who can speak with the power and authority of God. We need you to speak up and speak out in ward and state councils. I think Emma took this really seriously. She was a, an assertive woman who spoke up and spoke out when she was concerned about things. She also was the first woman to receive her temple covenants, to receive temple covenants in this dispensation. And I think it's interesting that she then gave those temple covenants and the temple endowment to other women. So she was a, an elect lady and a first lady. She, they called her the presidentess of the Female Relief Society, but they also called her the priestess. Isn't that, and that's a word we often hear in the temple, um, sort of the female equivalent of priest. And she really did work together with her husband and, and work to, to help other women to understand their place and their role in the restoration. So just quickly, Emma and her covenants, she was baptized in Colesville, New York in um, the end of June, June 29th, 1820, or no, 1830. Um, shortly after that, she was supposed to be converted or confirmed, <laughs> but a mob came and broke up the meeting and, and took Joseph off to court and to jail. They were soon reunited and back in harmony, she received this revelation, but even this revelation was not her confirmation or her patriarchal blessing. So she received this revelation in July of 1830. And then later, a short time later, a couple of weeks later, Joseph Knight and his wife, Polly came down from Colesville because Polly also had not been confirmed. And so they held a sacrament meeting and um, confirmed Emma and then confirmed Polly. So she's had several blessings and revelations. This revelation section 25 is a very unique one and an important one. Um, she received her patriarchal blessing from Joseph Smith Sr. in December of 1834. And you can actually find that on the Joseph Smith Papers website. And then like I mentioned, she was the first woman to receive her temple endowment and then she gave it to other women. So she was also kind of a temple matron. It's interesting to note that the first four general relief study presidents, including Emma, were also matrons of the temple. So there's Emma Smith, the next was Eliza R. Snow, and she led the female temple work in the endowment house in Salt Lake City before the Salt Lake City temple was dedicated, completed and dedicated. Then there's Zina Young, um, who also was the president and the temple matron of the Salt Lake temple. And then Bathsheba Smith, was the fourth general really society president and matron of the Salt Lake Temple. So I love the way that those two, the Relief Society and the Temple are connected. And I hope that we would think about that and, and what that means for us today and how can we connect the Temple and the Relief Society. President Nelson said, we need women who are devoted to shepherding God's children along the covenant path toward exaltation women who know how to receive personal revelation, who understand the power and peace of the temple endowment, whom, who know how to call upon the powers of heaven to protect and strengthen their families. This is exactly what Emma did. After Joseph died, her biggest concern was how she was gonna preserve her family. Now we know that there's tension between Brigham Young and Emma Smith, both were so, firmly uh, attached to Joseph Smith. Brigham really worried about how to preserve the church. Emma really worried about how to preserve the family. And she, she decided that it was better for her and for her family to stay in Nauvoo while Brigham and the Saints went to Utah. Um, she stayed there, she took care of Lucy Mack Smith, she raised her children and she was buried there next to her husband. So I wanna end with this question, what is your role in the restoration? If we understand Emma's role as pivotal and so important, then surely we each have a role in the restoration. The last verse of section 25 says that this, the Lord is saying, this is my voice unto all. We all have specific roles and, and responsibilities 
But I think he's also saying, this is my voice unto all, this revelation, because I want you to understand Emma. And I want you to understand how she fulfilled her role and what her role was. I am so grateful to be a member of a restored church with prophets and apostles and with opportunities to serve and to work, to be a part of Relief Society, to have a hymn book and worship in, in song, and to understand what my own personal role is. I'm grateful for Jesus Christ and for the, the part that he played in making this all come together. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Sister Reader. Um, we appreciate um, you unpacking this section for us and unpacking Emma. You have years upon years of knowledge and research that you have shared with us. And what a great way for us to start off this next week in studying about this section and in particular about Emma. Um, you know, as you shared, the church was not fully organized without um, the Relief Society. And the same goes true for Joseph Smith. He was not complete without his wife who is equal, equal to him. Um, those who are on Zoom can submit questions as we go through this question and answer. And we're starting to have a few come in. Um, but let me uh, begin with a few. We have about 10 or so, a little more than 10 minutes here. So are you okay to stay on a little bit longer with us here, Sister Reader? Absolutely. All right. As you've done your research on Emma Smith, has there been anything that surprised you or stood out to you in your research on her? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, a couple of things. I mentioned that she was an excellent horsewoman, and I had no idea, but I love that. I love that she knew how to command a horse, and she and Joseph would often ride their horses outside of Nauvoo just to have some alone time and to be together. Another thing that really surprised me was um, she had, okay, this is the coolest thing. Her dad's sister, so, um, so her aunt, married a free black man. And so she had biracial cousins. And I wonder if this really influenced her relationship with Jane Manning James and with other early um, Black members of the church who, and even the men who received the priesthood. Um, I love that, that she has that part of her. Another thing that really surprised me about her is that she was very politically and uh, she was very politically in tune. She knew a lot about the US Constitution, about the Illinois State Constitution and the Nauvoo City Charter, enough to correspond with the Illinois governor to try to receive uh, protection for Joseph. And she knew what to ask for and she knew how to ask that. And I had no idea that this girl from a farm in Harmony, Pennsylvania was so educated. She also had a great business savvy. She ran a dairy in Harmony. And then when Joseph was often out of town or in prison or, you know, on missions, whatever, she would take care of all the business of the family and of the church. So those were things that really surprised me. Wow. One of the questions was, how old was she when she died? Um, okay. I don't do public math, but <laughs> she was born in 1804 and she died in 1879. That's not hard. That's 75, right? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. He was 75. Yeah. Great. Um, and one of your favorite characteristics of Emma, you may have explained that already, but what, what, what's one of your favorite characteristics of Emma? I, I think she was a little bit feisty. And I really like that because I'm a little bit feisty too. But I think that she knew how to, um, she knew how to talk with Joseph and how to bring him in line when things were causing problems. And she also knew how to st stand up for herself, which is exactly what she did after Joseph died. And she made sure that she had means to take care of her children and to raise her children and that she they were taken care of. Okay, thank you. What would you tell somebody that finds it really messy and struggles with the situation Emma found herself in regarding plural marriage at the very beginning when she was unaware. Yeah, this is huge. And the, one of the reasons why I didn't talk about it was because I knew it would come up with the questions. <laughs> um, and this, this actually, I'll be honest with all of you, this was really hard for me to understand. 
um, because I think I would have been really mad and upset too. Um, so I have sort of come to my own understanding of Joseph. This is my interpretation, Jenny Reader's interpretation. It is not the church's interpretation or whatever, but this is my interpretation. First of all, I think it's important to realize that Joseph Smith's polygamy was very different from Brigham Young's polygamy. Um, in, in Nauvoo, everyone who practiced plural marriage was sworn to secrecy or they actually covenanted to keep it confidential and to not talk about it. Brigham Young, on the other hand, made it very public in Utah and Utah um, Latter-day Saints were known for their polygamy. And as a result, there was a lot of anti-polygamy legislation. Um, and Emma, um, I think Joseph Smith really was trying to find a way to expand priesthood to include women. And part of that was through this temple idea of sealing. And it's only the man and the woman together that receive the highest um, level of the priesthood, the patriarchal priesthood, or that belong to this Abrahamic covenant or the house of Israel. And so I think he often found women that had no opportunity or no connection. Um, there were many young women that were orphaned that came and lived with the Smiths and Emma cared for them. Um, and those were some of the people that, or the women that he was sealed to. Or there were women that um, had husbands that were, were not members of the church or were not like the most stalwart priesthood holders and was sealed to them. And so I think initially he, and I'm sure he probably talked about this a little bit with her, um, brought them into his family, into his kin network. He's expanding that house of Israel and he was giving them access to that priesthood and to that opportunity to serve. Now, I think he also knew her well enough to not tell her about certain women that he was sealed to. And um, I can't imagine the, the, the feelings of betrayal and um, anger that she must have felt when she realized that so many of her friends had been sealed to Joseph. And um, she really felt a sincere responsibility as the president of the Relief Society to encourage morality and purity and moral reform. And so she actually used the Relief Society as a vehicle. While polygamy was being practiced quietly, the Relief Society was her public venue and allowed her to speak up about what was going on. And it was even sort of expected of her. Um, little did she know that her presidency, her first counselor had been sealed to Joseph, Sarah Cleveland. Her second counselor, Elizabeth Ann Whitney, her daughter had been sealed to Joseph. Her secretary, Eliza R. Snow, had been a sealed to Joseph. The treasurer um, had been sealed to Joseph. The assistant secretary had not been sealed to Joseph, but then um, another secretary later on was. And so she, I don't think she knew a lot about that. She didn't talk about it. She didn't teach her sons about it. And I think part of that was because she had a hard time grappling with it herself. Also because she had made a covenant not to speak of it. Um, and then when the, when the news came and the, all the uh, federal legislation against the Mormons came and made them all look really bad in her eyes, she continued to deny it. And I think she got to a point where she was kind of stuck, where her sons became a big prominent part in the Restored Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, not the Restored, Reorganized. <laughs> There's a big difference there. And um, she also joined that church, but one of their tenets was that Joseph did not practice polygamy. And by this time, I think she was too deep in to really say, okay, he actually did. So it's a tricky, tricky thing. I don't, I don't know if that explanation works for you or not, but um, that's what works for me. Well, we can rest assured you have done so many years of research that you know more than the critics do about <laughs> it. I think can share with us in a very knowledgeable and academic uh, fashion and sharing that. We appreciate that. Two last questions here. Um, many of you want to know kind of, you've already shared a little bit, kind of after Joseph passes away and her life after, we know she's with Lucy Mack and taking care of her. Um, but another part of this question, if you want to answer it in two parts here, what's the biggest thing we get wrong about Emma? And maybe that pertains to her, you know, after Joseph dies. So 
I, th I'm going to tell you the story of her second husband, Louis Biedemann, because I think it illustrates um, what we don't understand about Emma. So she marries Louis Biedemann in 1846. And um, this is four years after Joseph has died. Oh, also, P.S., this is kind of back to the last question. She was pregnant when Joseph died. And also, there are no other children born to any of Joseph's plural wives. So we don't know how much that was a part of it. Anyway, um, she was pregnant. She um, had known Louis Vitamin. He made carriages. He was not a member of the church. He was kind of a strange character in the sense that he had been married one time, had two daughters. His wife died. Um, had been married a second time. This woman did not like his two daughters, so they separated. And in the meantime, at some point, he had an affair with a woman who had a baby, and they just went their own way. And then when he was married to Emma, he also had another affair and had a baby with a woman um, who lived in Nauvoo. Her name was Nancy Abercrombie. But Nancy Abercrombie could not take care of her son. And so Emma brought that son into her house and raised that son as her own. And then Nancy couldn't find work in, in Nauvoo. Nauvoo wasn't a bustling city anymore. Um, and so Emma brought Nancy Abercrombie into her house and she worked, she was Emma's nurse. And before she died, Emma ha called both Nancy and Louis Biedemann to her bedside and she made them promise that they would get married after she died to make Charlie a legitimate son. So I kind of think that this is one of her efforts to resolve polygamy and to make it legit. But she also had such a caring heart. She, ra she helped raise Louis Vitamin's two daughters. Um, the children in Nauvoo remembered her for her delicious cookies. Um, she, she, was, she was an amazing woman. Thank you. And the last question, that just is so insightful. Uh, many, I think, don't know um, what happened to Emma afterwards. And that was just so beautiful how how she cared for so many. So here's my last question, then I'll conclude with my sh a short testimony. But at one point in your research, I believe you described your own personal relationship with Emma as conflicted. But that changed with an experience you had one day with Sister Burton, the Relusi the Relusi, uh president of the church at the time. Could you share the experience and then close in sharing with us how your testimony has been strengthened in your research and why you choose to believe? Absolutely, I would love to. Um, I... <sighs> As an academic historian, I um, read the release the Navi Relief Society minutes um, critically because that's what I was trained to do, and I also read polygamy into everything that Emma said, and I felt like she was being um, she was being a little too feisty. I know I said I like that um, attribute of hers, but I think she was sort of using this to get back um, at her husband or at Brigham Young or whoever and um, using it unfairly and it troubled me and I remember one time I, um, I along with Kate Holbrook who was my co-author for At the Pulpit met with um, President Burton, Linda Burton in her office and she mentioned we were talking about the book At the Pulpit and we have some of Emma's words from the Nauvoo Relief Society we put them together as a discourse um, and I remember Sister Burton saying, you know, she was an amazing woman. She was the president of this Relief Society. And I felt this complete change in my understanding of Emma. No longer was she this uh, rebellious woman who didn't follow through with her covenants and with the church, but she was a woman who was acting as the president of the Relief Society and that she had a genuine office to fill and a genuine care of the women and care for their spirits and for their, their well-being and their souls. And I, it completely changed the way I looked at Emma. And I'm so grateful for that. I'm grateful for the opportunity that we have to see things um, in a different way once we get to know them better. And that's not just dead old people. <laughs> But it's also our neighbors um, and our family members and understanding what's going on behind closed doors or what's going on in someone's head. We can realize that these two are children of God and that this, these words are his voice unto all and that we all have a part to play. 
Sister Reader, thank you so very much for your testimony, for your research and knowledge. You certainly led us into this next week, excited to learn more about these sections, and we so appreciate your time and expertise in all of this. And I would just close um, some of the experiences that you shared um, are big ones for me too with Emma, her losing her son and being the meek but strong and under control to tell Joseph, go back to go back to Palmyra and find out what's going on there, basically. And then when she's Joseph's in Liberty Jail, but she's struggling her, her in her own way just as much, if not more, than Joseph crossing with her four children. So her struggles are just as real and just as deep and run just as much as her husband, Joseph. And then another one other moment in time for me that was kind of plays out with uh, verses five and nine that you unpacked really well about how she was to comfort and console and he was to support was in the translation of the Book of Mormon, that there was a, a day where he went to go translate with Oliver and he couldn't because he had something was wrong. And the spirit told him, you need to go make amends with Emma. And I just thought how precious it was that the Lord wasn't about to allow Joseph to go on with revelation and other things without having this sweet relationship with his wife. And so we appreciate all that you've shared. I'll just close again by the same quote that you shared uh, some minutes ago, but Emma on her deathbed to her sons where she shares about her testimony. And it reads, my belief is that the Book of Mormon is a divine authenticity. I have not the slightest doubt of it. Though I was an active participant in the scenes that transpired and was present during the translation of the plates and had cognizance of things as they transpired, it is marvelous to me, a marvel and a wonder, as much as to anyone else. I know Mormonism to be the truth. I just think that is a powerful statement that you've shared and I'm just reiterating here that um, she knew the church was true and I end with my testimony that I know this church is true, that the Book of Mormon is authentic, that it is the word of God. And I am so grateful to have another witness aside from these three. In fact, she's probably needs to be placed right there, if not ahead of these three witnesses because she witnessed every bit as much as these others about the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon and grateful to have her witness too added to all these others and leave that with the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.